Welcome into the 49er Access Podcast. My name is Sterling Bennett, and we have tons to discuss today. San Francisco is targeting a new safety, visiting with Julian Blackman in town today. They're also looking at receivers in the NFL draft, and Juwan Jennings is officially back in the red and gold. We'll dive into all of that this afternoon. I want to ask you kindly to like, share, and subscribe. And thank you for joining the show today live on YouTube x or twitter and facebook you can put your comments in the chat below i will get to every single one of them and without further ado let's dive into today's 49er news now the first topic of conversation is actually yesterday's news so kind of it's old juan jennings put on instagram that he had uh, or put the contract his, his his tendered contract on instagram on his ig story with the message, we on to year number four, for real, for real, let's go, ain't no stopping. Basically, uh, Juwan Jennings is back with the San Francisco 49ers. He has signed his second round tender, and again, will return next season for the red and gold. I know it isn't official just yet. They haven't put pen to paper just yet from what we know. Now, the reality of the situation is, if Juwan Jennings feels comfortable putting his contract on his Instagram story, the assumption would need to be made, hey, I've, I have officially signed that contract. Um, in other news, San Francisco has their number three receiver back, and the only person they have to quote-unquote retain is Brandon Ayuk, which today we did get some news as well when it comes to his status as a potential trade target of other teams. Uh, moving on to the next topic of conversation, that is visits. San Francisco is holding visits today with Julian Blackman, free agent safety. Now, if you've joined the show in previous episodes or previous times, you will know. And we have discussed Julian Blackman as a potential uh, safety target for the San Francisco 49ers as they embark into what can be considered maybe the unknown when it comes to Talon Noah Hufunga's injury. Torn ACL, those things are always tricky. Guys aren't the same. Hufung is also going into a contract year. Uh, I am someone who believes, depending on the safety they sign, which Julian Blackman would fit into this conversation and in, into this uh, category of safety, he's just starting caliber safety. He's not coming here to be a bench player. He's not coming here to uh, be a third safety. No, he's coming in to be a starter. Started 15 games last year. Uh, although has dealt with injuries in his past as well, Julian Blackman is a starting caliber safety. Uh, coming off the best year of his career, started 15 games, had 88 total tackles, 65 solo tackles, had a, a career-high eight pass defenses, five tackle for losses, and four interceptions, uh, and did have a 72.6 coverage grade and a 57.5 passer rating when targeted. Again, Julian Blackman visiting San Francisco today. We've heard Justin Simmons' name. Now we're hearing Julian Blackman's name attached to San Francisco. Uh, I like the Julian Blackman move more than Justin Simmons simply because I do think San Francisco can get Blackman for cheaper. He would also, like Blackman, while yes, is a starter, does give you the room to go back to Hufunga at any time. Uh, if Blackman goes down, if Blackman isn't playing well, you then have the option to return to Hufunga starting. And I know Niner fans scoff at the idea at Hufunga being gone in one year's time, and I understand that. Hufunga and healthy has been awesome, whether it's special teams, whether it's starting at safety. He's been awesome. And I do think for the Niners, you find yourself in a... I don't want to say peculiar, but but you find yourself in a tricky situation because you want to retain a lot of people, right? And you put yourself in a spot where you can retain Tao and Noah Hufunga. But if there is a position, which I think is becoming more like running backs, right, where safeties are not valued very high, I do wonder if the drafting of Jair Brown and the targeting of a starting safety, like if they can get a safety for cheap, now for two years time for three years time let's say it is julian blackman who they can get from on, on a three-year contract and get him relatively cheap uh, and avoid a potential safety marketing boom right or this past year running backs were in the toilet the past you know four five seasons 
this year, running backs got paid. Not big money, but good enough money, right? You saw guys like Tony Pollard and Josh Jacobs and others get paid a large sum of, sum of cash, whereas players like Talanoa Hufanga, players like Justin Simmons and players like Julian Blackman, who are good safeties, San Francisco may want to avoid a safety market boom. Now, will that come? We don't know. But it could be San Francisco thinking so far ahead that Hufunga's injury on a contract year, depending on what he's asking for, could you get ahead of the curve and replace him with a player like Julian Blackman off a career season where now he needs a job and everyone else has their safeties or has their safety spots filled? Could you find someone for cheap in, aka, Julian Blackman? Now, there is some drawback, right? Because Julian Blackman does have or has had a torn ACL in college in 2019 and tore his Achilles two years ago, right? He tore in 2021, and he only played five games that year. So there is injury history with Julian Blackman. But uh, what does San Francisco want to do here? And, and, I, and I, it does lend to the credence that they are looking, or at least not promising, Hufunga his job back. And that's a hard pill to swallow for Diner fans, but in a, in a reality where you have to pay Brandon Ayuk, you have to pay Brock Purdy, uh, San Francisco could be trying to thin out the margins. And if you can buy your safety cheap now and avoid maybe a Hufunga you know, big contract next year if he does play well again, uh, you, in a sense, save yourself, albeit maybe hurt yourself production-wise, you save yourself in a position where – you don't need to pay a safety big money. Like the last big name safety I could think of getting money, strong safety, not free safety. Like Minka Fitzpatrick, you pay. Jamal Adams got big money and he sucks. Like he's just not good anymore. Whereas Talano Hufunga is kind of the in between of like he's had the injury history, but he's really good when he's healthy and he's a playmaker. There's no way around not wanting to pay Hufunga. Like that's, it sounds dumb. It sounds idiotic. Why wouldn't you pay a playmaker? But again, San Francisco, like Mike Silver said, is not promising. It's not guaranteeing Hufunga his job back. And with by who they're targeting, all the sense in the world would you know, lend to believe, okay, like they want to find a safety to eventually replace him if he isn't healthy or if they don't want to pay him the contract he asks for. And so Julian Blackman would be one of the targets. There isn't many left out there. It's Justin Simmons, who there's rumors they offered him a contract, but no one can confirm that. Then there's Julian Blackman, and there's guys like Ashton Davis and Quandre Diggs, which some of those guys make sense, uh, but a lot of those guys feel like vets who wait this thing out, wait till after the draft, then sign. Blackman doesn't feel like that. He's, he's 25 years old. bring in someone like a Julian Blackman and and pay a cheaper, cheaper sum of money to a player like Blackman or Ashton Davis. Uh, Leon Sandcastle, which, w what a great name, first off. Leon Sandcastle, the the, the alter ego of Deion Sanders. <laughs> the NFL Combine a few years back said he'd love to get Ashton Davis. I believe in that. Uh, and, I, and I'm sorry the internet is, is wonky here. The wind is crazy again today. On a, although it's a wonderful day in the Bay. Uh, I live in the East Bay, so the wind is just not having it. All that to say, moving on from Jennings and Julian Blackman and moving to receivers, because that was kind of the big topic of today is receivers, right? Uh, the Niners right now have their hands all over the receiver market, but... Other teams seem to have their hands all over their receiver in Brandon Ayuk. Now, we've covered the, the Steelers rumors and the Jaguars rumors, but um, when certain media people talk, you listen. When certain media personalities, journalists, reporters speak, you listen. Like, Matt Mayoko knows the Niners' room better than most. Matt Barrows knows San Francisco inside and out more than most, right? Whereas there are smaller guys who may be great at analyzing things you don't tune into, right? Because, or, or at least you don't trust them as much as you would 
the big name reporters. But Albert Breer, who I believe was someone who said they were going to draft Trey Lance in 2021 and has been tied with the organization plenty of times. Uh, I've seen him there a handful of times at OTAs, at many camps, talking to Kyle Shanahan, this, that, and the other. Like he's tied and has sources inside the organization with Sports Illustrated. Uh, he put out in his Q&A uh, discussing Brandon Ayuk's future with the Niners. And he talked about that you know, trading him is not out of the conversation. And he listed a couple of reasons as to why that is the case. And I'll, re- I'll read them off for you now. But he said that San Francisco has a surplus of position players, mainly skilled position players, being Debo Samuel, Chris McCaffrey, George Kittle. He said they have a surplus at skill positions. He also said if San Francisco can get a first-round pick for Ayuk, uh, the Niners come out, and I quote, out no worse for the wear. And it's funny, too, because while you can listen to these big-name journalists and reporters who do great work, no one's knocking them by any means, um, they just really aren't always tied into the organization. And while I don't think they're getting a first-round pick for Ayuk, it's it's Breer's next point I kind of scoff at and say, eh, I, I, I'm not too sure there, buddy. Um, and, and maybe he's right, but... He points to Shanahan's successful development of receivers, which I think goes 50-50, right? You did develop Debo Samuel. Shanahan did help develop Brandon Ayuk. In that same breath, you did miss on Dante Pettis. You did miss on Jalen Hurd for injury reasons, and you have missed on Danny Gray. So of the receivers you've drafted in the first three rounds, you're batting 500, which if this was baseball, great. And really, 50-50 isn't too bad in general, but Brandon Ayuk was a first-round pick. You better hit on it. <laughs> like, if you miss on the first-round pick, I mean, that's a that's a big knock on your resume. But you missed on a second-round pick. You missed on a third-round pick. So, yes, while Shanahan's history of, you know, a first-round pick receiver has been good, it's only been one of them under his regime with the Niners, so I like I would not classify and point to Kyle Shanahan's successful development of receivers as a reason to trade Ayuk for a first round pick and say, well, they can just find somebody else. Now, I don't think Breer is saying it's going to be a one for one replacement, but I, I, I have a hard time buying into the idea that well, if, if you get a first round pick for Ayuk, they're going to hit. Because Kyle's so successful, it's like, no, that's not <laughs> it's not always how that works, my friend. Um, and then and, and uh Beer also points to a rookie receiver wouldn't stop San Francisco from making the Super Bowl. Now, that's true. I don't think having a rookie wideout would doom San Francisco's chances of making a Super Bowl. But I do think having a rookie unproven receiver without Brandon Ayuk on the field and a Debo Samuel across from him, who, yes, a former All-Pro, but has also had injury history, including this past year in the playoffs, I think would doom San Francisco. Like, there are plenty of skilled wide receivers in this draft. In fact, they say it's the best wide receiver class potentially ever. All that to say... Let's say it's a Brian Thomas Jr. from LSU, who's a good receiver I'd love to have in San Francisco. Very unlikely. But let's say it is Brian Thomas Jr., who could be great. Outside of Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors, can you definitively say that one receiver in this draft is going to have this excellent season to you know, be maybe a borderline pro bowler or be able to lead your team in targets like Debo Samuel cannot lead this offense in targets again he just can't he can't take the beating of having the ball in his hands that much he also isn't utilized in that nature so whoever you get if you are going to trade Ayuk which Albert Breer is saying is not out of the you know own possibility okay if that's the case point me to a prospect don't tell me it's a it's a possibility point me to who you think is going to be that guy because they're not getting Malik Neighbors, who who could be that guy. They're not getting Marvin Harrison Jr. They're not getting Roma Dunze. Like, they're not getting, like, let's say it is pick 17 or 20 to Jacksonville or Pittsburgh. You're not getting a top four receiver. 
And if you are getting a fringe Brian Thomas, if you're lucky, can that rookie come in and lead this team in targets? Or is he going to have to take a back seat and Juwan Jennings take the, takes the next step? Maybe that's the case. Maybe it is. But don't tell me, oh, it can happen, and don't tell me who they would use to replace Ayuk with. Yes, they already have Jennings pretty much signed, sealed, and delivered. They have Debo Samuel. Two good, one great receiver in that room. But you're not going to just insert rookie in the room and say, yep, cool, we're done, like, and, and you're going to be our IEC number two. Like, Shanahan, for as successful as his development may have been with Debo and Ayuk, and both those guys played their rookie seasons, Ayuk wasn't Ayuk year one, and you can't expect anyone to be that. And for a team wanting to capitalize on their window, you don't, like, forget how great Ayuk is. Just look at his targets in the offense. He's the most targeted receiver on this team two years in a row. He's this team's leading receiver two years in a row. He is this team's best receiver two years in a row. But again, take out the production. Just take out the, just talk about targets. Is there one receiver in this draft you point to and say, yep, they can eat Brandon Ayuk's targets. Um, now there is a conversation as Bobo brings up, which Bobo, you're always here. I appreciate you so much. Um, that what about a trade? Ayuk for Devontae Adams. Now, Yes, you are saying that Ayuk's wife or girlfriend, whatever she is, said that she liked Vegas. I mean, to be honest with you, who wouldn't like Vegas? On a vacation in the Super Bowl. Now, Ayuk is from Arizona, so that's pretty close to Las Vegas. It's very close to California as well. But I know Ayuk, and I believe it was actually his brother or, or, or a friend he calls a brother, I believe, maybe. Um said that he wanted to go to Las Vegas. He also just, there also was mutual interest with Jag with, with the Jaguars. He also tweeted at Mike Tomlin. Um, all of that to say, let's say he did like Vegas. Let's say he did like uh, the Raiders and, and, and wanted to go to Las Vegas. Okay, let's, let's take a look at, and if I could bring it up here in a second, let's look at Devontae Adams contract. Because it's not like you're going to spend any money. Like, why not just pay Ayuk, who's 25 years old? And I get Devon to me when out of Las Vegas. He might. But why? So let's say Ayuk gets something similar to... Calvin Ridley, four years, $90 million or $92 million, whatever it was, in 50 guarantee seasons, paying Devontae Adams a 25 million, but the next 25 to $44 million a year and not pay Ayuk. No way. No way. I'm not paying Devontae Adams. 25 or 44 million dollars again. There's just no way. I can't swallow that pill. I cannot drink that drink. Uh, I'd rather pay a 25, 26 year old Ayuk 25 to 44 million dollars a year than the 34 year old Devonte Adams. There's just no like. I get it, right? You can't justify paying two receivers 20 million dollars. The reality of the situation is, for one year, they can. If they want to, they may not. But at least for one year, they can. And so I'm not saying Albert Breer is wrong. I'm not saying trading Ayuk won't happen, although I don't think it will. I just think that there is no easy fit. And every team, I don't care where they pick, every team from the Bears at, at, at number one to the Chiefs at 32, they cannot give San Francisco what they want nor in a draft class heralded as the best receiver class maybe ever, why would you then have to draft or trade a draft pick and also extend IU can pay in big money? Like, it just doesn't make sense. Like, we're in the world where the Chargers are cutting Mike Williams and trading Keaton Allen 
and, and, and doing all these things. And you've, you've seen teams that are in cap hell moving off of receivers. The Steelers are traded to Deontay Johnson, who's a good receiver, albeit has issues of his own in regards to effort. Why would a team like Pittsburgh, who is known of drafting the Antoine Randolls and the Antonio Browns pre-CTE, and it has found themselves in a place to being known as the best uh, drafters of receivers after the first round. They drafted two first round receivers, Plaxico Burris and Santonio Holmes, yet they continually hit on second round and down receivers. Why do you want Ayuk? Like, I don't believe anything in regards to, oh, we'll give you 20. Like, yes, could Ayuk be traded? Sure. If he, if he gets tough and he wants to play, you know, this his hard nose brand of negotiating, sure. But I will say this till it happens. San Francisco has leverage, and this idea they have a surplus of skilled position players, while isn't a lie, it's it's certainly true. They have Chris McCaffrey, and they have Kittle, and they, and they have Devo, and they have Ayuk. You take Ayuk out of that conversation, that receiver room gets extremely worse, and, and you can put in a rookie in there, sure, it's at 17 or 20, you can put in whoever you like outside of neighbors, Harrison Jr., Odunze, and Thomas. They're not making the 17. They're not making it to 20. So you got to pick up someone like Keon Coleman, Xavier Worthy, insert post top five receiver of the draft in your receiver room. That's fine. You can do that. But if, what if I told you they go into the season with Debo and Kittle and McCaffrey, Juwan Jennings, and a rookie receiver? You might say, wow, that's great. They saved money. Cool. And then Debo gets hurt week six, and he's out for a month, which happens every year. Kittle, who is healthy the majority of years, does miss time. CMC, who the past two seasons has been thankfully healthy, but does have injury history. Like, there is no promise. There's no guarantee that you walk into the year healthy and leave the year healthy. And you're going to trade Brandon Ayuk, who has missed, what, one game the past two seasons? <laughs> like, why? So I do understand there is a chance. You're telling me there's a chance that Ayuk gets traded. Sure. Knowing the Niners, knowing how this team is built, knowing the aging skill positions, despite the surplus they might have, I have a hard time buying into the idea that they're going to trade Brandon Ayuk because Shanahan's so good at developing receivers and you know, Shanahan has done wonders at drafting and developing guys like Dante Pettis and Danny Gray. And, and a rookie receiver wouldn't hurt their Super Bowl chances. Sure, it wouldn't. But let's take it this past year. Yes, they lost, and that sucked. But you Debo got hurt. Didn't play much. You take Ayuk off the field, who didn't have a great game either. But then you insert a rookie. And this offense that doesn't have Patrick Mahomes, mind you, and a head coach that stops feeding Chris McCaffrey in the biggest moments. Who would you want out there? Rookie receiver, unproven, or Brandon Ayuk? Like, Debo <laughs> didn't do anything against the Lions. Who saved that game? I'm sure there was some luck. Also, Brandon Ayuk's Lady Bug catch. I would not expect a rookie to make one of the craziest catches ever in Niners history. I would not expect Brock Purdy and a rookie receiver to have that kind of chemistry. Like when, when go back and watch the Vikings game, he targets Juwan Jennings on a pass over the middle where Ayuk is usually at. And if Ayuk was running the route, he would have caught the ball because that's where, that's where, Purdy throws it every time. Jennings stops. Ball gets picked off over the middle. Like the chemistry of Purdy and Ayuk have is, you don't find that. It's unfound in most quarterback receiver tandems. And when you do find it, you do not get rid of it. You do not move off of that stuff. So, like, take the Dallas Cowboys. The Dallas Cowboys have CeeDee Lamb. Great receiver. Phenomenal. Top 10 in the entire league right now. Undoubtedly, I can almost guarantee you they feel foolish 
not keeping Amari Cooper. Not because C.D. Lamb isn't great. Because they'd much rather have Amari Cooper over Michael Gallup and Brandon Cooks, who are both fine, good receivers. When you have a franchise quarterback or a quarterback you believe is your franchise guy, like Brock Purdy, you do you don't rip away their favorite weapon. That's foolish. You're setting yourself up for failure. Um, Bubba, again, is a great question here. Do you think Debo can still play wide back next season? I don't. I think he should just play receiver for now. Let our running backs play running backs. More Mason and Mitchell to go along with CMC. So that brings us actually, and it's a really good question here, because that brings us to our next topic. The top 30 visits San Francisco has lined up. They already have six lined up. They have two cornerbacks, Jamal Hill from Oregon. They have uh, Smith Wade. I believe it's Chow. Chow Smith Wade from Washington State. I could be wrong there, so forgive me. They have Marshawn Nealon from Western Michigan, an edge rusher. And they have a running back slash safety. I believe it's Sione Vaki from Utah. Um, but the two more important ones they have lined up for top 30 visits is Brendan Rice and Malachi Corley. Now, if you follow me on Twitter, uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, but if you don't, you should probably do so. But if you don't follow me on Twitter, and if you have, you can see, go back on my feed or type in his name, Malachi Corley. He's heralded as the bet or the, the next Debo Samuel. Now, I do find that foolish because having a pro NFL comp next to your name leads to wild and usually incorrect expectations of what you're going to be in the NFL. I would expect no player to come in and be the next Justin Jefferson or especially the next Debo Samuel, who might be the most unique receiver in the entire NFL. But all that to say, San Francisco does have their heads, their eyes towards these second, third, and fourth round receivers. Now, uh, Brendan Rice is someone that I think is more of a day three. Um, okay, you heard that uh, C-H-A-U is pronounced Shaw in game. So thank you so much, Leon Sandcastle. Thank you. I don't want to sound dumb. But I haven't, I haven't looked into him, so thank you. Um, Malachi Corley. <coughs> Excuse me. Still sick. Um, Malachi Corley is, again, heralded as the next Debo Samuel. Called the next Debo Samuel. And I love Malachi Corley. Uh, he's at Western Kentucky right now. He's a great leader. He has strong hands. Knows how to separate using his hands. Now that can get him in trouble sometimes with OPIs. Right? Um, but he's a broken tackle machine. Like, when you talk about a player, a receiver, no doubt, that can leave literal just war path behind him, that, that will leave two, three, four guys on the ground, broken tackles, laying behind him, and you sit back and say, how did he do that? That's a player like Malachi Corley. Now, he also is someone who isn't the fastest guy, but he's quick and he's extremely thick. Now, when I say isn't the fastest guy, he ran a 4-4-3. So <laughs> let's not like, when I say isn't the fastest guy, I mean, he's not running a 4-2 or 4-3. But a 4-4-3 is very, <laughs> very fast. Um, ran 23 miles an hour on the GPS. And he's and here's the thing. When you run a 4-4-3, and you run 23 miles on the GPS, but you're built like a running back? Like, Debo Samuel, like, he's a thicker guy, built like a wide back, right? Like, D Debo Samuel is a, darn near, he's six foot, 216 pounds. Like, he is a wide back for a reason. Malachi Corley is 5'11", 215 pounds. So he's, what, one inch shorter? and about six to nine pounds heavier than Debo Samuel. Um, I liken him, yes, to Debo in the way he plays, but maybe a thicker Jaden Reed for the Packers, right? Where he is someone that you want to manufacture touches for. Like, he doesn't have the best route tree. That's very clearly the truth. I do wonder, coming out of Western Kentucky, going to a Shanahan system 
what is his role going to be? Is it going to be this overexpansive, be my RB2, be my receiver number two role? I don't think so. I think it'll be a limited first season for Malachi Corley. But when you draft a player like Corley, or at least you show the intrigue of might want to draft a player like that, that goes back to Bobo's question. Do you think Debo can still play wide back? I think Debo can still play wide back. I do. Just not at the pace he's currently doing so at. Uh, we've seen the Debo Samuel end arounds work and not work. They're hit or miss now. I do wonder if that is Debo being almost 29 years old. I think he's 28 now, or is going into his age 28 season, multiple injuries. And look, Debo is someone that is built to last when it comes to taking these massive hits. But when you miss three games in the middle of the season and come playoff time for different reasons, mind you, you miss two playoff games uh, and you get hurt in your last one against Kansas city. You find yourself at least as a team in a place where you think those questions can Debo last, can Debo hold up? If I was the Niners, Knowing that I cannot technically replace either Ayuk or Debo, but there is a player out there that can at least limit Debo's behind the field touches, can can be the this quasi sort of wide back and and keep Debo fresh. And let's say instead of thirty touches the year, he gets fifteen touches. He gets twenty touches. That's going to keep you fresh. It's going to keep you more available. It's going to keep you on the field for longer. Like, let's say getting a player like Corley in keeps Debo on the field for three games during the season or keeps him fresh for the playoffs. Maybe what happens in Kansas City or against Kansas City is different. Maybe, maybe the outcome is different, right? So, well, yes, I do think you can still play Debo at the wide back role. I do think that role needs to be diminished because last year didn't even work that well. <laughs> like, let's be honest. When you see Debo Samuel in the backfield, you know it's coming. I know it's coming. Now, there are certain teams that can know it's coming and can't stop it. That's the truth. All that to say, when you have a player like Debo Samuel that is your, in a way, RB1, albeit it's technically your RB2, uh, via targets and stats production the past couple of years. What you want to do is keep him fresh. What you want to do is, for Debo, the best thing for him would, would it, like, it, it, it's tough because you want to use Debo in the best way you possibly can, which is at wide back. Like, he's a running back playing receiver. He isn't the greatest route runner. He's fine. But he, like, what? What he does with the ball in his hands, once the ball gets in his hands, is otherworldly. We've seen it so many times. He's won us games by himself. All that to say, I would rather throw Debo screen passes, throw him flat routes, get him beyond the line of scrimmage or near the line of scrimmage more so than, hey, be my running back for a play. The end arounds are fine here or there. But when you have a player like Debo, you have to manufacture touches for the odds they get hurt are going to skyrocket. And if you are the Niners, it would probably be best to get another player that cannot fill Debo Samuel's shoes, but that you have to manufacture touches for. And that's a player like Malachi Corley. Again, he runs a 4-4-3. He's 5'11. He's 215. There's a reason why he's comped to Debo Samuel. There's a reason why I say he's a thicker Jaden Reed, albeit Jaden Reed's a much better route runner. Like you either become Debo or Jaden Reed, or you find yourself being LaVisca Chenault as this gigantic hulking receiver that really can't play receiver and is now kind of a bona fide running back because that's all he can do. Like he was excellent being Corley at the senior bowl. Hit a 40-yard touchdown on a handoff reverse. Like, Corley is a guy, if you draft, instantly, while it may be a very limited role, instantly, 
gives you another playmaker, and gives you someone that in years' time can take away snaps from Debo. And even better, and this is the better case, they're on the field together in year one. Where imagine you have Corley or Debo in the backfield, and Corley or Debo land outside. The defense will say, wait, who are we stopping? Who's getting the ball here? When you have two players, and you already have Christian McCaffrey, but when you have Debo and you have Corley, if they draft him, if they can draft him, you now have essentially two receivers, two wide backs, you could say, that when defenses line up against you, they say, uh-oh, <laughs> they have two guys that can run through our entire defense. They have two guys that you have to manufacture touches for, and it's going to keep them on their toes. Uh Rene Rodriguez on Facebook asks, what round would Malachi Corley get drafted? So that's the question, right? We can talk all day about receivers and whatnot and, you know, how great they are and how bad they are, but will he be available? And the good thing is, is that depending on how the first round goes, Corley should be there in round two or three. I would like to think the back end of round two is the safest place for him. Um, I don't think he's a top 10 receiver in the draft. He's more of a top 20 in this draft, but this draft class is heralded as, you know, 11 guys to go in the first round. I don't believe that, but there's already five guys guaranteed to go in the first round. Okay, so that leaves 15 left, let's say, in rounds two and three. The teams that don't pick a receiver in the first round are going to go receiver in rounds two or three. It's just a guarantee. And if you're San Francisco and you want to get that right tackle or your edge rusher or your guard, whoever it is in that first round, and Corley is there, like, Corley is someone who I think not only could, if you want to, in a year's time, trade away Debo, he can slide into that role. I think Corley on the field at the same time as Debo, once you extend Ayuk, now that Jennings is basically back, it just adds like, and he's fast. It's not like he can be a burner. Like, he plays different. You're not going to say, give me a go route. But he ran a 4-4-3, which isn't blazing speed. But he's not afraid to run deep downfield. His route tree is limited. So he is going to have a limited role. If there is a role to step in for Corley in year one, it is the Debo Samuel wide back role on the offense. Now, I'm going to read you his stats. Because we're going to get into Brendan Rice next. And I want you to remember these stats here. So I took what Corley averaged the last two years. Now, mind you, it's Western Kentucky. It's not USC. So let's keep that in mind. But Corley, the last two years, has averaged 1,063 yards per season, 10 touchdowns, 12.8 12.8 yards per catch, almost 13 yards per catch, and 120.4 passer rating when targeted. Incredible two-year average. Incredible. He's someone that you look to and say, man, like, there is a yak monster right in front of our eyes. And if there is somebody, like, I'll put it this way. If San Francisco is in the business of re-signing Brandon Ayuk and looking to move off of Debo Samuel, Malachi Corley, like, I'll I'll rephrase that. If they're looking to extend Brandon Ayuk and move off Debo Samuel and not miss a beat and replace that role, the wideback, on the offense, Malachi Corley makes a ton of sense. And, And to hear they have a top 30 visit with him, I'm not saying they're going to take him because the draft can be a crapshoot and it can be crazy. But it does lend to the credence of, hey, Debo's 29 next year. And if we extend Ayuk and we don't want to pay two guys $25 million per year, we can get the Debo Samuel replacement, quote unquote, in the building now. Let him kind of get in the offense and, and learn things. And then once Debo's gone in one year's time, if he is gone, who knows, then you really wouldn't miss that much of a beat. Now, what Debo does 
is very different in regards to what other receivers do. No one's saying that, you know, Corley's guaranteed to be the next Debo Samuel, but he plays just like him. He's built just like him. Like, unlike Darius Tonys and, and LaVisca Chenault's and other players that have been told, that's the next Debo Samuel. Guys who have failed. Guys who have been forced into roles they're not great at because they want to mimic what San Francisco does with Debo Samuel. They gave Kadarius Tony number 19 because it was Debo Samuel's number in Kansas City. Malachi Corley is the closest thing we've seen to what Debo has done. And Corley transitioned from cornerback a handful of years ago. So, like, he's an overall great athlete, never had injury history, and he plays with that physical tenacity that a wide back role in the offense would fit. We have we have some questions here. Eric Soley, thank you, Eric, for joining us today. Asks Sterling, have you done your mock drafts? Will be cool to see you do a mock draft live. I'll tell you what, Eric. I had one planned after the post combine or after the NFL combine, and I just didn't get around to it. I wanted to do it. I don't pay for PFF. I don't pay for certain things, and I want to do it justice. And also, I haven't dove into every single prospect yet. I am currently in the in the process of making my kind of top ten at each position when it comes to who I target. If I was San Francisco, um, there's some you already know. I love myself some Taj Washington. I love Isaac Grendo. I love Jordan Morgan, uh, and I like myself some Malachi Corley. Um, Eric also says Corley is the answer. Even if we keep Debo having him be the returner and the fourth receiver makes me happy. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I said on Twitter yesterday that there's only two players in the second round I'd trade up for. Um, Corley is not one of them, but if he's there, man, man, <laughs> uh, take him. Uh, but I'd only trade up for two players. That is Chris Jenkins, defensive tackle from Michigan or Xavier Leggett from South Carolina, simply because San Francisco wants that burner and Leggett fits that mold, and he's also extremely physical, where I do think he can play the slot, he can play an outside spot, and he'd be just fine. Corley's, Corley isn't a one-trick pony by any means, but he's very limited in his route tree, where San Francisco might be able to expand, or I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase that, San Francisco will be able to do more with Leggett as a receiver quicker than Corley would be. Um, and, and and look, when, when you do a mock draft, it's always tough because, like Bobo says here, my mock drafts are always off. I, <laughs> they got Nick Bosa right, which was probably the guaranteed pick if there's ever been one. Um, but I had done plenty of mock drafts the past you know four or five years. I'm sure you guys have as well. You'll find guys that are undrafted in mock drafts or seventh round picks in mock drafts go in round four. And you're like, well, man, like who's making these mock drafts? Like we're seeing, you know, guys like I'm trying to think who it was last year, but but there's a handful of defensive players that I was, okay, you know, let's find some depth in this seventh round of, the, of this mock draft. And they went in round five, went in round four. And I was like, oh, like I either – like, and, and let's be honest here, who is diving into 500 prospects unless you're just a draft nut, which good for you. I'm happy for you. I ain't doing that. I ain't got the time to do that. I'll look at, you know, a couple hundred of them and, and that's it. But like, I will dive into specific players I want Niners to draft. Then I'll go through kind of a bigger board of who I think would fit and, and go elsewhere. But like the mock, like the mock draft simulators are, never accurate first round second round sure but like once you get into like the seven sixth round i mean all bets are off but <laughs> all that to say um malachi corley is is great uh and, and and i do think that if he's there you you have to pick him not round one maybe not even round two but if he's there round three and you have picks like san francisco has 10 picks and they were moved to the very end of the fourth round if they feel that, hey, we're out of reach 
And let's say they go with, in the first round, it's Jordan Morgan, a tackle. Let's say in the second round, they go Chris Jenkins or insert defensive player. And they're like, hey, we have to have a receiver. I could see them trading up some picks and getting someone like Corley or Ricky Pearsall from Florida. Like, it makes a lot of sense. And it, both those guys fit what San Francisco wants to do in, in different aspects. But Corley, knowing he's a top 30 visit now, I have my eye towards Debo Samuel's future in two years' time, or I guess in one year's time, but also just where San Francisco's mindset's at, which makes the next player they have scheduled for a visit puzzling to me because I am not sold on the next player <laughs> at all, <laughs> um, which will probably make Niner fans very upset. But Brendan Rice is scheduled for a top 30 visit with San Francisco, and um, I am not someone who buys into the idea of let's draft Frank Gore Jr. and let's draft Luke McCaffrey and let's draft like let's get legacy players in the building. Um, that isn't to say they aren't good, just to say that I see mock drafts that have all three of them back to back to back, and I'm like, why? <laughs> like, okay, like it's a nice story to have Jerry Rice's son and Chris McCaffrey's brother and and Frank Gore's kid. Like, that's awesome to see. I hope they have great careers, but there are so many receivers I have ahead of Brendan Rice. Like, I've seen some mock drafts, which again, are always someone's opinion. I've seen him going in round two. I've seen him going in round number three. I, the more that I've watched Brendan Rice, read up on Brendan Rice, he feels like a day three receiver, like round five. Like if you're going round four, late round four. Like I just don't buy into, well, he's Jerry Rice's kid. He's got to be good. Like is Brendan Rice or does he have the potential to be a good receiver? Sure. Like there is potential there with him. And that isn't to say that guys who have this, you know, have the scouts look at him and say, nah, eh, not very good. Like, Again, Pittsburgh drafts six rounders. They become all pros all the time. Uh, Juwan Jennings, seventh round pick, fell. And he is a, I don't want to say star, but he's a really good receiver in the NFL. Like, there are guys that just fall in the draft and get overlooked. And all it takes is one team to unlock their skills, and they're great, right? All of that to say that Brendan Rice, to me, it just doesn't really fit feel like a 49er he doesn't really I'm not really impressed with what I get with Brendan Rice like at least Malachi Corley can do one thing really well with the hopes of expanding on his skill set Brendan Rice really doesn't do anything well and that's not meant to be a knock like he's fine at a lot of things but he doesn't do any of them good that makes sense right like he's a solid route runner like i have no qualms about you know him being bad at that i, I don't but he doesn't accelerate well he on underneath routes doesn't separate well and yes he's six two he has 33 inch arms he has a wingspan of 78 and three eighths inches like he's got the physical tools that you want in a receiver when it comes to height and length, but like he doesn't, like he doesn't do much. Like in in two seasons combined, okay, in the last two years, I think Colorado and at USC, twenty four games, fifty four receptions, seven hundred and thirty six receiving yards, only five touchdowns. Like he he doesn't, he's not consistent enough to say second round pick. Like, I think he's maybe a third rounder, and I wouldn't be surprised if he goes day three. Um, he again, he, he his best, the best aspect of his game is he he's much better in space and he can be a red zone threat. That's cool. I don't think San Francisco needs a red zone threat or to flourish in space. Like, they need a burner, which is what they want. And Rice is not now. Now, to be fair, Rice ran a four four three, had a, had a twenty three 
miles per hour GPS, which is the exact same thing as Corley did. The difference is Corley's 5'11", 2'12", 209. Brendan Rice is 6'2". Like, yeah, you better run faster than a 5'11", 220-pound guy, 212-pound guy. He's a running back. Like, my goodness, you're a receiver who's lanky. You should run faster than that. Like, nothing Brendan Rice does, I go, like, I'm not wowed by him in any aspect of the word. Like, if he's there in the fourth round, fifth round, okay. But you don't overdraft for a player like Brendan Rice. And I'm not saying he can't be good. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying even if San Francisco drafts him, that I won't sit here and say, wow, like, this is how they should utilize him. I will sit back and say, okay, where do we go from here? All that to say, he's not going to start in year one. Now, most wouldn't if they have Ayuk and they have Debo. But I don't even know what his role would be. He's not starting over Juwan Jennings. He's not starting over Ayuk or Debo. Like, his role would not be defined. And now, unless somebody got hurt, which Debo gets hurt a lot. But... Like, he doesn't do anything. Like, if he played for a bad team, take Carolina. Carolina makes a ton of sense for Brendan Rice. Pittsburgh makes a lot of sense for Brendan Rice. Dare I say Kansas City makes a lot of sense for Brendan Rice. San Francisco does not, to me, make sense for Brendan Rice. He's a fine player. He's fine. He's not going to give you what you need. We've talked for the last couple of shows about, you know, San Francisco wanting to unlock the next door of their offense. They have the Yak Bros. They have the -the over-the-middle stuff figured out. They have the separator in Dayuk. They don't have the burner. And Rice is not that. And uh, to be fair, Corley isn't that exactly either. But a player like Xavier Leggett, I mean, man, like getting him in San Francisco would spell doom. And most defenses can't can't stop us anyways. You give me Xavier Leggett in this offense over Brendan Rice and Corley, matter of fact. Like we have, I will be gushing if that occurs. I will be gushing if San Francisco pulls that off. Um, But like Brendan Rice would be exactly what Ronnie Bell was last year. He might do punts. He might do kicks. He, he ain't playing much. And again, no one is saying he can't be good, that there is a potential there. There is. But if you go back and watch his senior bowl, which I guess you can't watch it, but in the practices, you go and listen to the reports. Uh-uh. No. People left the senior bowl with a lower draft grade on Brendan Rice then they came in with him, which is not what you want to hear, not what you want to see. Meanwhile, they left praising Malachi Corley. His draft stock rose while Brandon or Brendan Rice has dropped. And again, I'm not sitting here saying this guy's not going to work out. I'm not going to condemn, not going to condemn anybody to being a bad player, unless you're Cam Law too. <laughs> Um, but you can keep Brennan Rice unless he's in the fifth round away from me. I'd rather have Leggett, Pearsall, Johnny Wilson, Corley. Um, you can maybe say a Troy Franklin, albeit I'm not, I don't love him, but he is a really good route tree. Um, I just think you, you need to have some speed and, and look, that's a very generic thing to ask for. Like, Oh, gotta have speed. But I, I do think like I talked about with, with Wayne Breezy the last show, that the if you're looking for a receiver, your motto, your mindset should be, how can I find my Lightning McQueen? How can I find a player that is, I am speed, I am speed. Now, you want more than just speed, mind you, but San Francisco's missing aspect to the offense is who can take the top off? That's not Brendan Rice. I know you can watch 
USC's pro day and say, man, he tracks that ball well, and he's going to go up and get it. No, he's not. Like, you can track a ball well when no one's defending you. You put a cornerback out there, you put a safety out there, and maybe I'm wrong, and he'll come out here rookie season and just make me look stupid. That's fine. I don't mind being wrong. I'd rather me be wrong if he's on an opposing team, though, because I don't want him coming here and being a bust and I'm right. You know? Like, I just don't see him playing much on this team right now. And if you are San Francisco, you can look for the future fine. But I want to find a player in the second and third round, fourth rounds that can actually impact my team today. And I don't think Rice does that. Now, to be fair, he has previously returned kicks and returned punts. So maybe that's a role they view him as, which, okay, we can certainly get into that conversation down the road if he gets picked by San Francisco. But I, I just don't think that Brendan Rice makes sense. Whereas Corley, you sign me up, buddy. <laughs> like, you you can be my Uncle Sam, and I'm right there saying, oh, we're going to the military. Um, Eric Soley says that the Debo thing, or the funny thing about Debo is that lots of people think he's going to get worse. Dude had 12 touchdowns last year, missed three games, and slid over 1,000 yards, and almost 1,000 yards receiving. 12 touchdowns is really, really hard to do in the NFL. Uh, and Eric, you're right. So the the idea that you're going to replace Debo Samuel is foolish. The idea that you can just insert X player and Debo 2.0 go, it's wrong. Like Debo is so valuable to this team, to this offense. And we saw when he, when he didn't play, it wasn't the same team, which is so funny because then you hear fans saying trade Debo now. No, no, <laughs> No, you don't, you don't trade Ayuk now, you don't trade Debo now. You trade Debo next year. <laughs> and I think the only thing that can honestly stop Debo is the health. That's my only big question about him is, can, as he ages, can he stay healthy? Can the production stay up with him? Because he's a great receiver. He can do these gadget plays, the end arounds. Like, he can take plays to the house anytime. Whenever you play Seattle or the Rams, it is the Debo Samuel show. Um, so all that to say, how do you keep that player on the field? You find someone like Corley that can take some of those hard hits away from him to keep him fresh, keep him healthy. Um, we have one question here by uh, Kali Young. <clears throat> He's always in the chat. Thank you so much for joining the show again today. What do you think about Jordan Morgan? Well, I will bring up my tweet about him because I have been gushing over this man for you know, two, three weeks now. Um, he has been somebody that uh, I have said I'm going to mock draft him at pick 31 if he's there until the draft's over. Like I think if there is one player that should be the pick at 31, it is Jordan Morgan. And... I know he has shorter arms, 33-inch arms, which ironically is Brendan Rice's arm length. Oh, it's too short. He, yeah, he's not, not going to be a tackle you know, in, in the NFL. He's going to be a guard. Okay. Be a guard. But he's played over nearly 2,500 snaps at tackle in college, which there are a lot of people that point to, oh, you have, what, what is it, Mims and, and others. Like, those guys have played, like, under a 1,000 snaps. Get me a guy that's proven that tackle, that has shown the ability to keep up with opposing uh, edge rushers and defenses. Like, Jordan Morgan is not just – he's not just proven, but he's been around for three seasons, three, four, and someone that you can look at and say, yep, that guy has the pedigree. And I'm trying to find my my – my tweet here still, but we're athletic. And I know San Francisco, like what they want, like Shannon is so particular with his guards and tackles. Like go back to the Atlanta scheme that he had. He was not picking up these, 
you know, 6'5", 345-pound long-armed tackles. McGlinchey had 34-inch arms. And I know McGlinchey is taboo in San Francisco, but he had 34-inch arms. Morgan's only 33. That's one inch. I mean, there are certain aspects in life where an inch makes a difference. Uh, the arms are not one of them. <laughs> so um, if he had like 31-inch arms, 32-inch arms, okay, it's 33-inch arms. Like, my God. <laughs> like, it's not that big of a deal. And if San Francisco, who just extended Colton McKivitz, mind you, for an extra year, if they feel comfortable with him, and let's say it's right guard, they don't really know what to do. They have Feliciano for a year, who he himself said was going to be his last ride, whatever that means. Then you have Burford, and you have Ben Barch, who I think they like and they want him to play center. Um, you may want a guard, which, okay, Jordan Morgan, you got shorter arms by one inch, mind you. You can play guard. He has guard tackle flexibility, but his ability to change direction, create leverage, uh, he does need to improve his run blocking, but he's an excellent pass blocker. Like, what's one thing we've harped on? This team is always a great run blocking offense. You need to have a pass blocking tackle. And I I, I, I do think Jordan Morgan, for how athletic he is, his change of direction and his pass blocking can help San Francisco win games. Um, now they've talked to him a lot, uh, at the combine, I believe they were at his pro day. So they have had some communication with him. Uh, but there, I have not heard of a top 30 day with him yet. Well, obviously see, they have plenty of time to get those in, but the drafts in what a month and five days, like we're creeping up on draft day in one month's time. And so, uh, they're off to a good start with Corley. And obviously more names I already mentioned earlier, but you give me Corley. I want to see Leggett. I, w- I want to see Jordan Morgan on that list. Like he makes a lot of sense. My only concern is, is that a team like Green Bay who just cut Bakhtiari is sitting there like what, 25 or 24, whatever they are. At, I can see them taking Jordan Morgan. Um, I can also see, you know, him falling past 31. Uh, it just, It depends on what San Francisco wants to do. I would say take your tackle that has guard flexibility because what Jordan Morgan's skill set is fits what Kyle Shanahan wants. And don't distrust me. You can go listen to the Athletic Football Podcast. They talk about picks 32 through 26. They mention Jordan Morgan is the the primary Shanahan offensive lineman. Like If you don't want to believe me, which, which is fine, Go get somebody else's opinion. People are mocking Jordan Morgan to San Francisco like crazy. And there's a reason for it. He fits what they want to do here. He fits that Kyle Shanahan mold in this offensive line. And I do think, again, I know the idea is get your right tackle now. Once Trent retires, move him to left tackle. It's a great strategy. Let's say that doesn't happen. Let's say Jordan Morgan is the pick. And let's say San Francisco says, you know what? You're going to play right guard for us. We're all going to say, whoa, like, what do you mean? And at the end of the day, right guard's probably going to be better (laughs) than what it was last year. At that point, Spencer Burford might be out of town or might become a tackle. Who knows? Um, But I do think that Jordan Morgan starts at right tackle, and you can always move him inside. Whereas a player like was a Graham Barton, I think, from what was a Duke, like he's going to be a guard. You got to swing outside. And I think if you are San Francisco and the Niners and you're Kyle Shanahan and you're going through all these tackles, you're like, well, I like this guy and that guy. I would like to think there is a gold star next to Jordan Morgan's name because When you just watch him play, when you read about him, when you listen to coaches and scouts talk about him, he just screams Kyle Shanahan. Like, he's a hyper-athletic, short-armed right tackle that can play guard, has an amazing change of direction. What else would you want if you are Kyle Shanahan? 
and he's a much better pass blocker than McGlinchey coming out. Whereas Morgan's probably a worse run blocker, but you can get away from that because you run left like 75% of the time anyways, and you have Feliciano back, who's an excellent run blocker at the guard position. So you can, like Morgan can be, can be an instant improvement in the pass blocking game while improving run blocking in the next year or so. Like for Jordan Morgan, like he, he just screams San Francisco 49ers. Whereas other guys are unproven, haven't played almost 2,500 college snaps where Morgan has that tackle. He can play guard, he can play left and right tackle. Like it just screams match made in heaven if you are San Francisco. Whereas a player like Brendan Rice, it's like, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Like you're not wowing me. <laughs> you're just there. I see you. You're Jerry Rice's kid. Cool. I don't care. <laughs> like, and I wonder what that thought process is because I am no college scout. Let's not get that <laughs> confused by any means. But what Brendan Rice, like, I'm hoping and I'm begging that the Niners aren't just like, hey, Jerry Rice, yeah, we'll talk to your kids. Or, like, I don't think Shanahan would do that. I don't think they're viewing this as a Nepo baby situation. But San Francisco also did sign Jerry Rice Jr. like a decade ago now, which is seems crazy to think about, as to the practice squad. Now, practice squad isn't the draft, mind you, but like I don't I I don't think it's the case. I'm just hoping there is no well, you know, say I'm Jed York. Hey Kyle, um it's Jerry on the phone. He he wants you to talk to Brendan for a little bit. And it's like seriously like I don't want to talk to Brendan Rice. Um now I don't think they use that top 30 visit on him for no reason. So I think they're interested in him. But I think there are a lot better receivers. Like Brendan Rice is probably receiver number 20, 25 in this draft to me. Like day three pick, rounds, what is that? So the draft's what? First round's on Thursday, second and third are on Friday, then it's fourth and fifth on Saturday, and sixth and seven on Sunday. So probably a day three pick. And even then the fit doesn't make sense to me. But I digress. I would take Rice's teammate, Taj Washington. He's awesome. That, that little guy is crazy. He is awesome <laughs> to watch. Um, but we'll dive into more draft stuff come April. Just wanted to get into, you know, we, we have now, what, six top 30 visits scheduled. And it might give us an idea as to where San Francisco has their eyes to. Um, and if you go through their history... Uh, the Niners have been apt to take guys they've had multiple interviews with. Um, and so as this progresses through in near draft day, we'll look back at, hey, they've talked to this guy three, four, five times. And I'm hoping one of those guys is Jordan Morgan. I'm hoping one of those guys is Taj Washington, Isaac Garendo, and Malachi Corley. And, and, and if we're lucky, Xavier Leggett, but all that so far away. We have one month and like five days. We have so much time to talk about the draft. And yes, Eric, we will get into mock drafts next month. April is my designated mock draft month. I'm hoping every Monday in April, you will do a mock draft Monday. It's a hope. It's hopefully going to come to fruition. But I'm hoping once April hits, mock draft Monday every single Monday leading into the NFL draft. There's still free agency still happening as right now. Maybe they sign Julian Blackman. We'll see what else occurs. We'll see if a massive trade-up happens. Watch them Vikings. They look like they want to trade up. That could affect San Francisco in a weird way. There's always a big chain reaction. Like, I want to wait till April to see what occurs uh, at the NFL draft. I can't wait to see what happens then. But look, it's Thursday, March 21st. Hope you're having a wonderful, what is it, springtime now? I think Easter's next weekend. Going to hide some Easter eggs and go get some candy, whatever you want to do. Uh, I The football season is on my mind, but it's a wonderful time for weather in the Bay Area. 
it's sunny outside, a little windy, but the sun's out. Go have some fun. Go walk your dog. Take a walk to the park. It's a great time. Go do a mock draft on your phone as you walk your kid in your stroller. That's what I do. I got I got this big dog behind me here. I walk him, and I just do mock drafts all day. That's, that's all I do, all day. Uh, but anyways, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, leave that review. Follow us on social media at 49ers underscore access is the X in Twitter. Uh, 49ers dot access is the Instagram. Bobo's walking his dog right now. <laughs> See? You can get a lot done when you walk your dog. Javon Hargrave signed when I was walking my dog last year. There's a lot of, a lot of good things happen when you walk your dog. <laughs> All that to say, you can also use our promo code 49ers Access 49 E R S A C C E S S at SeatGeek.com and save yourself $20 off your first purchase. Baseball's here. If you want to be like Shohei Otani and invest in something and gamble in something, well, you gamble and watching a sporting event, MLB, NFL, NBA, and you can save yourself some money and not be like Otani and lose money by using our promo code at SeatGeek.com. All right, guys, have a wonderful rest of your week. Maybe you'll see me. Maybe you'll hear from me. But if you don't, like, share, subscribe, leave that review. And until next time, as always, stay faithful.